Hello, Saddleback. Wow. You look great today. I want to say hi to all of our campuses and those of you who are watching online. If you'll take out your message notes, I want to welcome you to 50 Days of Transformation. Now, during these seven weeks, we're looking at some of the most famous classic texts in the Bible. Last week, we started with the uh, most famous story or parable ever told by Jesus called the parable of the prodigal son. This week we're going to look at the most famous psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23. So if you have a Bible, you open to Psalm 23. All of the message notes have all of the verses on it, so you could pull that out too. When my two boys, Josh and Matthew, were uh, young, they were budding entrepreneurs. It seemed like every week they had a different business deal they were coming up with something to sell, something uh, that they were gonna make money at. Josh was the entrepreneur and, and Matthew was the salesman. And one day they decided to capitalize on the increasing level of stress they saw in our society. So they created this thing called homemade stress balls. What they did is they took balloons and filled them with sand and tied a knot in it. And then when you got under tension, you were supposed to squeeze this and it would relieve the tension in your, uh, in your life and in your body. And so uh, well, they, they came in one day to my office, and they had a bucket of these, and, and Matthew said, Dad, would you like to buy a stress ball? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, would you like one for free? He said, I said, yes. He said, great, because when you buy one, you get one free. <laughs> That's salesmanship. That is salesmanship. Now, it's true, we spend an awful lot of money on relieving stress in our lives. Stress at its core is simply a threat, real or perceived, whenever your body feels threatened by something, an emotional, physical, spiritual, mental threat, stress responses take place in your body. And uh, your, your blood pressure goes up, your pulse quickens, your adrenaline shoots into your uh, body, and all kinds of other physiological effects. Now there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's pretty good if, if you're standing in the road and a truck comes after you uh, and, uh, and, you're, and, and your stress response says, get out of the road, you get that extra burst of energy, that's a good thing. The problem is, in chronic stress, your body never shuts down. And many, if not most of you, are living under chronic stress. And we're gonna deal with that today because hundreds and hundreds of scientific and medical studies have shown that chronic stress in your life is dangerous and devastating to your physical health. It's damaging to your brain to always be under chronic stress, and uh, it's deadly to your body. Stress, chronic stress, can kill you. Now last week, as we started the uh, uh, the 50 days of transformation, we looked at transforming your spiritual health and we looked at the habits for spiritual health. This week, I want us to turn the dial a little bit and we're gonna look at the habits for physical health. Now, since thousands of you are already involved in the Daniel plan, there's a lot of stuff we don't have to cover because just a couple weeks ago, we talked about five of those habits and I'm not gonna go over those again, of uh, the right kind of food, <laughs> the right kind of fitness, the right kind of uh, friends, uh, faith, and focus. And that's all in the Daniel plan, and thousands of you are doing that, so we don't need to cover that again. What I want us to do this weekend is specifically look at the effect of stress on your body, and what the Bible says is the antidote to the most common stresses in your life. So if you're a little tired, a little worn down, a little stressed out, you picked a good week to come to church because we're gonna help you out as we look at the most famous psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23. Now before we look at uh, the text, uh, let me just identify the seven most common sources of stress in modern life. You might write these down. These are the seven things that cause stress most often in today's lifestyle. Number one is worry. And the reason why worry is number one is because there's a lot more things to worry about than there used to be. Uh, nobody worried about identity theft 20 years ago. Uh, nobody worried about losing their cell phone years ago. 
Uh, there are a lot of things we worry about today that your parents didn't have to worry about uh, because of their new worries in, in an increasingly complex world. Worry. The second greatest source of stress is hurry. <coughs> hurry. And hurry comes from the increasing pace in our life. Would you agree that it seems like the world's going faster and faster? We live in a microwave nanosecond world where everybody wants it now and they want it yesterday and they want it immediately and everything is going faster and faster. That creates stress. Speed creates stress. Obviously when you're running through a town it's a whole lot more stressful than simply walking slowly through a town. The third thing that causes stress is crowds. Crowds. And as the world gets more crowded, people are getting more stressed out. And the reason why is we have a thing called urbanization, and that is people are moving to the cities. They're moving to the cities. Life used to be rural, but now it is definitely urban. 83% of America lives in a large city, 83%. You know, in 1800, there was only one city in the world that had one million people in it. It was the city of London. It was the only city on the planet that had a, had a million people in it. Today there are over 500 cities in the world that have over a million and thousands and thousands that have half a million and, and there are even now what we call mega cities uh, like Mumbai, India which has you know, 32 million, uh, Tokyo which has 36 million, Mexico City 35 million. These are enormous cities. And you can go block after block after block without ever seeing any dirt. It's, it's all been paved. And, and uh, this crowding and this uh, urbanness uh, creates additional stress in our lives. It causes traffic uh, stress. You know, I, I read one uh, study that said in the 75 largest cities in America that last year Americans spent or wasted over four billion hours waiting in traffic jams. Just ima imagine the amount of productivity lost on that. And, and that wasted over six billion gallons of gasoline while you were stuck in traffic. That's a, that's a stress. Number four, a fourth modern stress is multiple choice or more choices than ever before. And actually the more choices you have in life, we think that's more freeing, more liberating, but actually it's more paralyzing because uh, it, it creates indecision. You know, you used to walk into a, a grocery store and there'd be a couple kinds of toothpaste. There's now 60 kinds of toothpaste out there. Do I really have to choose? I mean, I only need to choose the minty fresh and the non-minty fresh. But now they've got 14 different ingredients and every one of them has, well, this one's left out and this one's added in and you go, how do I know? And so the more choices you have, I mean, it used to be like there was cough syrup. Now there's like 50 kinds of cough syrup. How do I know which one's the right one? And the more choices you have can be paralyzing. When you think of all the different ways you can get your coffee in Starbucks, <laughs> that could be a little overwhelming. I just need a cup of coffee. That's, that's all there is. Choice number five is the loss of privacy. The loss of privacy, actually any loss, is stressful. But in the modern world, the loss of privacy is that, uh, you know, uh, there are not just the government, but all kinds of corporations keeping their number on you. And they want to know where you are and who you are and what you've said and what you've bought. And every time, you know, you buy something now, somebody rings it up and they're keeping a record on how many pampers you've bought and when you need to move to Depends. You know, you move from Hot Wheels to wheelchair, okay? And, and uh, so the more choices there are and the loss of privacy, that causes um, stress. Number six, uh, the word I put down is pluralism. And what is pluralism? Pluralism is we now live in a world where the people around you often have very different beliefs, convictions, lifestyles, cultures, and things like that. 100 years ago, America was pretty much a homogeneous place. There were commonly held values that people uh, shared in common, but that's just not true anymore. Technology has shrunk the globe, and we are now a melting pot, but we're really more like a stew. 
And people who live all around you and who work all around you often have very different beliefs than you, often have very different uh, uh, cultural values and things like that. What does that mean? It means that there's gonna be conflict. And, and conflict uh, comes from this being around uh, uh, people of different things. And of course the media feeds on conflict and it's created this culture of incivility where people are just rude to each other. Then number seven is the fear of the future. The what ifs, the fear of the future. Now we're going to look at uh, these things after a song, but I wanna read you Psalm 23. Because all of the antidotes are in Psalm 23. And it's just six verses long, but we find the seven antidotes in these six verses. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all I need. He makes me lay down in lush green meadows, and he leads me beside calm, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the most beloved psalm in the Bible. And it's not by accident because it's given comfort to people for thousands of years. But when you really dig into it and when you understand each of these metaphors, it is telling you how to lower your stress. It is a model of stress management. Okay, look at there on your outline. Proverbs 14:30 says, peace of mind makes the body what? Healthy. It's not always what you eat, it's what eats you that makes you unhealthy. And so we've gotta figure out how to lower the stress and raise the peace of mind. How many of you would like to live longer? Could I see your hands? Yeah, okay, look at the next verse. In the living, New Living Translation, it says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. So it's all about attitude. Now I want us to, today, in Psalm 23, take this passage and tear it apart line by line. And I want us to see that there are seven spiritual habits for reducing stress. They actually parallel the seven sources of stress that I just gave you uh, in the modern world. And I said that the first cause of stress in your life is worry. And you worry because you think, well I have what I need when I need it. And anytime you expect other people to meet your needs instead of God, you're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be disappointed, and they're not gonna be able to, to, to measure up because nobody can meet all your needs. No man, no woman, only God can meet all your needs. So the first antidote to stress, this is an important one, write it down, look to God to meet all my needs. That's the first thing David says we need to do. I look to God to meet all my needs, and that calms me down. That way I'm not gonna be disappointed because I'm gonna trust in God. Now, this single change in your life, if you would stop looking to other people to meet your needs, if you would stop looking to your husband, to your wife, to meet your needs, you, your stress would go down dramatically. Stop putting your security in things that you can lose. Sometimes people put their security in their job, they lose their job, they lose their, their peace of mind. They put their security in their marriage and then their spouse dies or they go through the tragedy of a divorce and then they go, who am I? What is my identity? Or you put, your, you put your security in your money. There's a lot of ways you can lose your money. As your pastor and friend, I recommend you never put your security in anything that can be taken away from you. I'll say it again. You should always put your security Find your security in something that can never be taken from you. You can lose your job, you can lose your health, you can lose your reputation, 
You can lose your spouse, you can lose your mind, but you cannot lose your relationship to Christ. And so you put your security in that. You look to God to meet all your needs. Verse one, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all I need. I I shall not want. I, I, I have nothing that I don't need because he's gonna be my shepherd. I stop expecting other people to meet the needs that only God can meet. Now the Bible says this in Romans chapter eight. Since God did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us all, won't he surely give us everything else we need? The the logic there is obvious. If God loved you enough to send Jesus Christ to die on the cross, don't you think he loves you enough to take care of every other need in your life? Yes, of course he does. So stop looking to other people to meet your needs because they're gonna let you down. There's no one who could possibly meet all your emotional needs. There's no one who could possibly meet all your physical, mental, spiritual needs. So David says, I'm not gonna look to other people to meet all my needs. I'm gonna look to God. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all I need. What's he saying here? That the first step in stress reduction is worship. I refocus on God. I stop focusing on expecting other people to meet my needs, and I refocus on God. Look at this verse up here on the screen. Isaiah 30 verse 15 says this. The sovereign Lord says, only in returning to me and waiting for me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. Notice he didn't say, not in anxiety and in fear, not in hard work and planning, not in uh, self-motivation and positive mental attitude. He says, in quietness and confidence is your strength. You say, the Lord is my shepherd. In fact, I want you to, 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 to make this an affirmation in your life. Every time you start to get stressed out, you need to pause and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. When you start to get stressed out, like I don't have what I need right now, the Lord is my shepherd, he's gonna provide, he's gonna take care of me, I'm gonna look to God to meet all my needs. Now once you've laid that, that's the bedrock of stress management, then you go to the second step, and here's verse two. I need to obey God's instruction about rest. I need to obey God's instructions about rest. You know, so much of the stress in your life comes from always being in a hurry, always working too much, always feeling like you got too much to do. It's why you overwork, you never can get caught up. How many of you feel like I can never get caught up? Let's just have true confession. I can never get caught up, yeah, that's true. Right now, I'm, and I have over 1,200 unread emails in my inbox. I have over 12,000 emails in my inbox. There's no way I'm ever gonna get caught up. Just no way I'm ever gonna get caught up. Well, so what do you do? Well, you look to God to meet your needs and then You obey God's instruction about rest. There's no way I could say, well, I'll just stay up for the next three months and read all those emails. (laughs) No, you still gotta rest. Now think about this. If God had wanted to, he could have created human beings without the need for sleep. Why 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 did he create you with the need for sleep? You will spend one third of your life asleep. Now if God's only gonna give you 60, 80, 100 years here on earth, why wouldn't he give you 100% of the time? Why would one third of that time be wasted in sleep? Because God wants you to learn the importance of rest. Rest is so important, God rests. God modeled it. When he created the whole universe, the Bible says that after he finished all creation, it says on the seventh day, God rested. Now why did God rest? He wasn't tired, God doesn't ever get tired. He was modeling the importance of rest to your life. And he says every seventh day you you rest. And he said that's what God did. He modeled it. Now the Bible's filled with instructions about rest, recreation, and relaxation. In fact it's so important, God put it in the Big Ten. It's in the Ten Commandments. Right up there with don't commit adultery and don't murder 
and don't lie, he says, every seventh day you take a day off. Hello? That's how important a Sabbath is in your life. Jesus later said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God said, I created this idea of you take a day off every seven days for rest, recreation, worship, and restoration. He goes, that's my idea, it's for your benefit. It's so you don't burn out. And yet today in our modern society, people aren't doing that. Even on their day off, they're working. And a lot of people, even if they go to a church service, then they go home and they go right back to work trying to get done all the stuff they didn't get done during the work week. That's not a Sabbath. That's not a Sabbath. Now, God says, I want you to rest. Psalm 23, verse two says this. He makes me lie down. Circle the phrase, makes me. He says, God makes me lie down. Has God ever had to make you lay down? because you aren't smart enough to obey what he says about rest and take a day off every week? You know, sheep aren't smart enough to rest when they get tired, so the shepherd has to make them lay down. And if you're not smart enough to get the rest you need and take a day off every week for rest, your body will make sure you do it. And God has wired your body in such a way that if you don't take time off, your body will make time off. Anybody wanna give a testimony on that? If you just keep working, 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 you're gonna get sick. Because God wired you to obey his commandments. Getting enough sleep is essential to stress management. I want you to write this down. My best requires rest. You are not wasting time when you're relaxing. You're not wasting time when you're resting. It is better to have loafed and lost than to have never loafed at all. That's why God gave us a Sabbath. And here's the Sabbath, Exodus 34, 21. Six days are set aside for work, but the, every seventh day you must rest completely. Circle the word completely. You must rest completely. Even during your seasons of plowing and harvest, you must observe a Sabbath day of rest. Notice that even in your busiest, busiest season, it's no excuse. You may be a tax accountant and it's April. You still have to take a day off, okay? Uh, I mean, you may be a retailer and it's Christmas season. You still have to take a day off. You may be a farmer and it may be uh, harvest or planting season. You still have to take a day off. Now, what am I supposed to do on my Sabbath? Three things, write these down. Here's three things you're supposed to do on your Sabbath. Number one, rest my body. You need to rest your body, physically rest. There's a biblical basis for a good Sunday afternoon nap right there. Okay. Number two, just not when I'm speaking. <laughs> Number two, refocus my spirit. I rest my body on the Sabbath and I refocus my spirit. And what is that? That's worship. It's what you're doing right now. You are refocusing your spirit right now by coming to worship. And in corporate worship, we, we recharge and refresh our spirit. And number three, I am to recharge my emotions. Use the Sabbath to recharge your emotions. That's what recreation does, it recharges your emotions. Now, different things recharge different people. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, about how you need beauty in your life, but you need you need to do something that restores you and re-energize you. It could be a hobby, it could be a sport. These are good things that God has given to us as gifts in order to recharge your emotions. You know, um, it doesn't really matter which day is your Sabbath. In fact, the book of Colossians in the Bible says, doesn't matter which day you choose, you just need to choose a day. My Sabbath is not Sunday, Sunday's a work day for me. By the way, so is Saturday. My Sabbath is Monday. And on Monday, I rest and I refocus and I recharge. And, that's, and I don't do any work on Monday. That's my Sabbath. And by the way, don't call it your day off because if it's your day off, you'll cheat on it. And you'll say, oh, I got all these things I need to do, I'll do this. But if it's your Sabbath, then you use it for what God intended. You say, but I feel guilty when I relax. Well, Jesus didn't. When you study Jesus' ministry, he often took time off to relax. In fact, he'd go out and do an entire period of intensive ministry, and then he'd say, guys, we need to come apart for a while. 
We're going off to the mountains. We're going off to the desert. We got to come apart. And I always say, if you don't come apart, you're going to come apart. And, and he said, let's go off to the desert. He goes, there, out there where there's these springs and those, those date palms, palms and springs and palm springs. <laughs> and he said, there's a biblical basis for going to palm springs right there, okay? He says, go out to the desert and, and we're going to go relax for a while. I'm sure they didn't have a jacuzzi to sit in, but it would have been nice. But Jesus didn't feel uh, guilty about it. Did you know that during the French Revolution, they canceled, the French government canceled the Sabbath and said every day is going to be a work day and after a couple years they had to reinstate it because the health of the nation had crumbled. You need this in your life. You need a Sabbath. I heard about a guy who said to his pastor, he said, Pastor, I tried to get a hold of you all day on Monday. And the pastor said, well, I'm sorry, it's my day off. And, and the man said, well, the devil never takes a day off. And he said, yeah, and if I didn't, I'd be just like the devil. Some of you, that's why you're so mean. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not getting enough rest. And you're a little devil because you're not taking the Sabbath. And the devil's not your model. Okay, number three. I, I look to God to meet all my needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I obey God's instructions about rest. He makes me lay down, lie down. And then number three. I recharge my soul with beauty. That's the third thing you need to do. Recharge my soul with beauty. Beauty is an incredibly important thing in stress management. Ugliness stresses you out. Beauty inspires. Beauty encourages. Beauty motivates. Beauty stirs up positive emotions. Have you ever thought about why God made the world so beautiful? I mean, you look at sunrises and sunsets, and you look at the intricacies. Uh, intricacies, <laughs> you try saying that, <laughs> of, uh, of beautiful flowers that are never even seen. And all of these sights around the world that many people, well, human eyes won't see, but God created a world of beauty. He could have made earth just like the moon, just a moonscape, or like Tatooine. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Star Wars, that's the desert planet that Luke was from. Skywalker. <laughs> and he wanted to get off that planet really quick because it was pretty ugly. Anybody want, should I go on about the gospel according to Star Wars? Yeah. <laughs> he could have made it just a desolate, dusty, gray planet. No, no, God created a planet with vibrant colors. Have you ever heard anybody say, I heard it the other day when I was on, actually last summer, I was on vacation up in Yosemite. We were under some redwood trees and a man said to me, I feel so close to God in nature. Well, of course you do. He created it. Man was made to live in a garden, not in a skyscraper. When God created man, he put him in the Garden of Eden. He didn't put him in a skyscraper. You weren't made to live in everything concrete. God made us to live in, in a garden, in a beautiful place. Do any of you remember Woodstock? You're really old if you just raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> really, really old, okay. There was this rock concert many, many years ago. Joni Mitchell wrote a song about it called Woodstock, and it says, well, I came upon a child of God. He was walking along the road, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going up to Yasger's farm for this rock and roll band. And there's a line in the chorus that says this, we are stardust, we are golden, and we're caught in the devil's bargain, and we've got to get back to the garden. And it's a capital G. She's talking about the Garden of Eden. We've come a long way from the Garden of Eden on this planet. People say, I feel close to God in nature. Of course you do. It's God's beauty, and beauty inspires, and beauty motivates. Notice the next verse, Psalm 23, verse two and three. He makes me lie down, but where does he make me lie down? He makes me lie down in lush green meadows. Golf course. <laughs> and leads me beside calm, quiet waters by the sand trap. <laughs> he restores my soul. 
Okay, he restores my soul. Now, it's no wonder Psalm 23 is the most beloved psalm because we can all visualize this one. When I say, think about lush green meadows and a calm, quiet lake, you relax just thinking about it. Okay, if I say, think about downtown LA, you get stressed out. <laughs> if I say, think about meadows and calm waters and babbling brooks, nature refreshes because beauty inspires. Now, you need beautiful scenes. You need to see beautiful scenes and you need to hear beautiful sounds in order to keep the stress down in your life. You need to add beauty into your life. Let me give you some suggestions, write these down. Number one, get outside every day. If you're not getting outside every day, your stress level is going up. Even if it's just your backyard, even if it's just walk around the block, even if it's take your lunch outside, walk outside of the office, and sit outside and look up at a tree while you eat your sandwich. You need to get in touch with God's creation. You need to surround yourself with beauty. Get outside. Let me give you a second suggestion. Start the day with God, not the media. Before you read any text message, before you check your email, before you turn on the radio, to some talk radio people screaming at each other, before you turn on the television for some morning show so you can hear Bad Morning America, <laughs> you need to get in touch with God first. The first seven minutes of your day set your mood every day. So do you wanna start it with an alarm clock and then the worst news of the day coming at you? No. You don't really need to know all the bad news first thing when you get up. You don't need to know that. You need to turn on some praise music, some worship music. You need to get in touch with God. You need to let the first five, 10 minutes of your day be with the Lord. And that'll dramatically reduce your stress and improve your mood. Another suggestion, number three, intentionally put beauty around you. Whether it's pieces of art, or music that inspires you, or something, a craft, something that, that you know, I used to collect seashells, and I collected them from all over the world, and I did it, and I had, had my, my, my library filled with them because looking at those things simply inspired me. I go, wow, that, the intricacy of that Nautilus, how God inspired that. Looking at beauty lowers your stress level. Listening to beauty lowers your stress level. So I highly recommend that you either take up an instrument or... Um, or a, some kind of art or craft to create beauty. You are most like your creator when you're being creative. And so you need art in your life. You need beauty in your life. You know, by the way, art and music are two of the greatest arguments against evolution. Why? Because they're totally unnecessary for human survival. And if the whole survival of the fittest really works, then why in the world do we have music and art in the world? because you're more than a body. And God made you for worship. Did you know more songs have been written about Jesus than any other subject in human history? Did you know more books have been written about Jesus than in any other subject in human history? Do you know that more art has been created about the Bible and to honor and glorify God and Jesus than any other subject in history? Why? God gave us music and God gave us art for one reason, to express emotion. That's the only purpose of it. You don't need it for physical survival, but you do need it to really live, to be who God made you to be. So fill your life with art, and fill your life with music. You know, when I get stressed out, I go home, I pick up a guitar, I start playing a guitar. I sit on the piano, bang on the piano. A ukulele doesn't matter. Kazoo, you know, whatever. Just comb and paper. Like last week, you said, make a joyful noise. It doesn't have to be pretty, just make a joyful noise. Philippians 4.8 says this. You'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true and noble and reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious. 
It sounds like television, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. That is not television. Okay. You'll do best by filling your mind with things that are true and noble and authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Now because of sin, there's a lot of ugliness in the world. There are a lot of unpleasant things in the world. Whatever you give your attention to is gonna either raise or lower your stress. Some of you, during 50 days transformation, you need to do a fast on the news. I hate to tell you this, but you could miss the news for the next 50 days and it's gonna make one difference in the world. If you read the newspaper one day later, you'd realize how much news really isn't news. The media is tuned to make you think stuff's important that isn't that important. Has no bearing on your life. And if you used all the time that you spend listening to news or watching news or reading news and instead spent that listening to God, reading his word, listening to worship songs, your stress would be dramatically lower. It's your choice. Now if you wanna stay stressed out, keep watching local news because if it bleeds, it leads on the local news. In other words, if there's a crime that happened anywhere within distance, it's gonna be reported on the news. Is that really what you wanna hear? Is that what you really need? Is that gonna make you a better woman, a better man? No. So, I recharge my soul with beauty. He makes me lay down in green meadows and calm waters, beside calm waters. Number four, the fourth thing we have is go to God for guidance. Go to God for guidance. Now, this is important because a common source of stress in your life is indecision. You can't make up your mind. Some of you right now are wavering. You're at the fork in the road, or maybe you've got multiple options, and you just can't decide, and the stress is killing you. You can't decide whether to get in or get out or do neither. You got too many choices. I recommend that you make God the number one source for guidance. Not the opinions of your friends, not some pundit on television, but that you go to God for guidance because he always tells you the truth. So what I do, I say, God, I need wisdom. And in James chapter one it says this, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and doesn't condemn them or criticize them. He gives it generously and graciously. God is waiting to give you wisdom, you just have to ask. So you say, God, I need wisdom. And I pray and I ask. Then I read the Bible, I read this book. And then I wait and I think and I be quiet. And I listen and I sense. And at the right time, maybe not immediately, at the right time, God will put that idea in my mind. And he'll go, wow, that's an inspiration. That's what I need to do. I want you to write this down. Write this affirmation down. It's an affirmation. God will guide me at the right time. God will guide me at the right time. Not at the wrong time, and his timing is perfect. He's never early, he's never late. If you have to make a decision about next year, he's not gonna give you the answer today because he wants you to trust him. The Bible says there's enough trouble in each day, take one day at a time. So God's gonna give you the right decision and the right guidance if you'll trust him, but he'll do it at the right time. Psalm 23 verse three says this, he guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. That's an affirmation. God, I believe you're gonna guide me at the right time in the right way. I believe you're gonna do that, and if you have that belief, he's gonna do it. Number four, or number five, I trust God in the dark valleys. I trust God in the dark valleys. Now we're all gonna go through dark valleys in our lives, you'll go through many of them in your lifetime. One of the fifth common sources of stress is loss. And you can lose your job, and you could lose your income, and you can lose your money, you could lose your health, you could lose your reputation, you could lose a loved one. We all go through many losses in life, and when you go through loss, there are always two common reactions. One is fear, and the other is grief. Now, grief is good, fear is bad. When we did a series of seven messages on grief last year, 
And remember I said grief is the way we get through the transitions of life. Grief is a good thing. The Bible says God grieves. It's a godly emotion. In fact, if you don't grieve, you get stuck. Some of you have had a major loss in your life in the past and you just shoved it down. You, you stuffed it instead of grieving. And what, when you stuff it, you get stuck at that stage emotionally. And you've never gone any further because you didn't go through the grief. You got stuck. And you maybe need to go back and grieve some things in your life you've never grieved over so you get unstuck because you got unstuffed. Stop pushing the, the, the pain down. Just grieve it, let it out. It's not gonna kill you, grief will not kill you. You let it out, it's good for you. It's how you go through the transitions of life. And then you get unstuck and you can move on and you can grow up emotionally. Grief's a good thing. On the other hand, fear is a bad thing. Not once in the Bible does it say grieve not, sorrow not, weep not, cry not. What it does say is fear not. And it says that 365 times, which means there's one for every day of the year. Because grief doesn't paralyze, fear does. Fear does. Psalm 23, verse 4, here's what David says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I don't fear anything. Why? For you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. Now remember, he's using this shepherd metaphor, shepherd with his sheep. Shepherds always carried a rod and a staff. These are the two tools that you use to protect the sheep, to ward off wolves and to protect the sheep. He says, I I'm not gonna stress out about this because God is my protector. God is helping me and I'm gonna trust God in the dark valleys. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Some of you are going through the valley of the shadow right now. Maybe the valley of the shadow of death. It may be the valley of the shadow of debt. It may be the valley of the shadow of conflict. It may be the valley of shadow of depression. It may be the valley of the shadow of discouragement. But you're going through the valley of the shadow. Now shadows are scary. Remember how you used to get afraid of shadows when you were laying in bed as a little kid? Some of the things though I've learned about shadows are this. Shadows can't hurt you. They can't hurt you. A truck can run over, that hurts you. But if a truck shadow runs over you, it doesn't hurt you. Shadow can't hurt you. Shadows are always bigger than the source. Isn't that true? It's your fear of that greater than the actual event. Shadows are always bigger than the source because the, it makes them look bigger than they really are. But here's the good news. Wherever there's a shadow, there's a light. You can't have a shadow without a light. And so the key of when you're going through the valley of the shadow and to not be afraid is to turn your back on the shadow and look at the light. Because as long as I keep my eyes on the light, the shadow can't scare me. And Jesus is the light of the world. That's how you go through the valley of the shadow of death. That's how you lower the stress. I trust God in the dark valleys. Maybe you're going through that right now. You need to pray like David, Psalm 142, verse three. When I'm ready to give up, he knows what I should do. When I'm ready to give up, he knows what I should do. I want you to write this down in your outline. I don't have to know the answers when I know God. I don't have to know all the answers about what I'm going through if I know God because he knows what I should do. And I'm gonna turn my back on the shadow and I'm gonna look at the light and I'm gonna walk through the valley of the shadow. I'm gonna trust God in the dark valleys. That'll reduce the stress of loss. Number six. In the next verse of Psalm 23, David says, I'm gonna let God be my defender. Let God be my defender. Now, another common source of stress is conflict, opposition, criticism, attacks. 
And there are people in your life who simply don't like you. There are people you work with, they criticize you, maybe out of jealousy, maybe out of fear, but there are pe- maybe there are people in your, li- in your own family. Maybe there's a family member who will not let you enjoy anything. They just are always ragging on you. They're always putting you down. They never have a positive word. If you have any success, they poo-poo it, they downplay it, they, they minimize it. And you've had these people in your life and they're always attacking you and they're always putting you down and they're always criticizing you. And when that happens, your natural response is what? Attack back, criticize back, retaliate, get even. But when you get even with somebody who's criticizing you, it puts you on the same level. Now if you forgive them, it puts you above them. But if you, if you, if you get even, you're no better than they are. Now, because of the pluralization in our society, we have people around us all the time who totally disagree with us. People live with around you and work around you who don't agree with you and don't like you and maybe don't even like Jesus. And, and as a result, they will criticize you and they will put you down. And, and, and there are other reasons too, too, not just because of that. But in our society today, our civilization is losing its civility. The, the world is getting more rude. Would you agree with that? And one of the things that's causing that is the internet. Because the internet allows you to hide behind, anonymously behind a screen and spout all kinds of vile things against other people. And if things that people would never say to you face to face, they wouldn't have the courage to say, they'll spout off and they will minimize you and belittle you and they'll be rude to you and they'll criticize you and they will attack you on the internet. All they are doing is revealing the smallness of their heart. Little people belittle people. Little people belittle people. Great people make people feel great. So when somebody's always belittling other people, they are just revealing the smallness of their heart that they have a little knot for a heart. And they have to belittle others thinking that's gonna make them feel better. How do you handle rude people? How do you handle mean people? You don't. You let God handle them. You let God be your defender. Now David is a pro at this because David knows what it means to be attacked, not just emotionally or verbally, but literally physically. In the story of King David, David as a young man was anointed by Samuel, God's prophet, to be the next king of Israel. But it was done in secret, so nobody knew about it. David knew about it, his family knew about it, he knew he was the rightful king, but then for the next years, the better part of much of his life, he spends it running from the first king who wants to kill him. And he's hiding in caves. And he's, in, and, he, and he's being maligned and he's being demeaned and he's being put down and rumors are being told about him. He's being criticized constantly. And yet he would never would say a bad word against the king. He would never attack back. He would never retaliate. He only said good. And God was preparing David to be the king after his own heart. And David says in Psalm 23 verse five, look at this verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What's David talking about here? He, it's a metaphor. He's saying, you know what? God is so good to me. He says, I'm gonna give you, David, a banquet in front of your enemies, and I'm gonna anoint your head with oil, which is a symbol that says, I'm gonna say to the world, this is my guy, back off. This is the guy I've chosen. This is the guy who's gonna be the next leader. He anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. God, you are so good to me in spite of my attackers, in spite of my critics. You just keep blessing me and blessing me and blessing me. And he says, I'm just gonna trust you and I'm gonna let you be my defender. Psalm 18, verse one and two, David says this. How I love you, Lord. You are my defender against criticism and everything else. 
You are my protector. You are my strong fortress. In you I am safe. You protect me like a shield. Does David sound stressed out there? No. But he's writing this in a cave. He's, I'm not worried. God's in control. God is my defender. I don't have to defend myself. God will take care of me. And let me tell you something. It takes a lot of faith to rest when you're under attack. It takes a lot of faith to trust God and just not defend yourself when you're being maligned, you're being misunderstood, you're being misjudged in your office by other workers, rumors are spreading about you or people saying things about you online. When that happens, everything in you wants to rise up and say, I've gotta do something about this, I gotta correct this, I gotta teach the truth when you're under attack, but it takes faith to rest God. It also takes humility. It takes humility to not retaliate, but to let God be your defender. You are most like Christ when you remain silent under attack. Jesus was constantly attacked. And who was he attacked by? The religious people. The religious people did not like Jesus. Common, ordinary, everyday people, they loved Jesus. The prostitutes, the pimps, the tax collectors, the crooks, the thieves, the poor, all the outcast people, the lepers, they all loved Jesus. It was the religious people who could not stand Jesus. They called him a glutton, they called him a drunk, they called him a son of the devil, they called him the devil himself. They said he came from the devil, they said he's a false leader, false prophet, and on and on and on. Jesus never, ever retaliated. He never got them back. He never corrected them. He just remained silent. In fact, even right before he goes to the cross, the Sadducees and the Pharisees take Jesus into custody. They make him a prisoner. They take him to the Roman governor, Pilate, and they say to Pilate, this guy is trying to overthrow Rome. Now they couldn't even find any witnesses to corroborate this. It was just a total bogus lie. It was an attack. This guy is trying to overthrow Rome. He wants your job. He's trying to get rid of you. Pilate looks at Jesus and goes, is that true? Is what they're saying right? And Jesus, it says, quote, he spoke not a word unto him. He wouldn't even dignify the accusation with a response. He remained silent because he had entrusted himself to the care of the Father. You are most like Christ when you remain silent in criticism. And I'll tell you a little secret, and I've learned this from experience. When you do this, you end up gaining more power, more authority, more influence, more anointing. You're Critics actually end up helping you. They think they're hurting you by criticizing you. But when you respond correctly, it actually helps you. Because when people criticize you unjustly, falsely, and they say all kinds of mean things about you, Jesus said this, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Not only are you gonna be rewarded in heaven, but God gives you, when you refuse to retaliate, but you respond in love, you say nothing but good things about your critics. When you do that, God gives you more power, gives you more influence, gives you more authority, and gives you more anointing. Your critics end up actually helping you. Is that cool or what? So then that's how you can thank God for your critics. Because they, thank you God for these critics because it allows me an opportunity to be more like Jesus which means I'm gonna get more love, more power, more grace in my life, more blessing. And they end up actually causing you to be more blessed than before. You're blessed, not stressed. Peter has a good way to say this, 1 Peter 4, 19. So if you're suffering according to God's will, keep on doing what is right. By the way, notice, some suffering is God's will. Some people say, oh, well, suffering is never God's will. Well, they just haven't read the Bible because it says it right there. Some suffering is God's will. If you're suffering according to God's will, 
Keep on doing what is right and trust yourself to the God who made you for he will never fail you. Now there's one more common source of stress and that is fearing the future. And so the seventh thing David says in this beautiful psalm is I expect God to finish what he starts in me. I expect God to finish what he starts in me. Now, are you a person who's afraid of the future? Are you a what ifer? You're always what ifing. What if this happened? What if this went wrong? What if that went bad? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? <clears throat> if you're a what ifer, it leads to enormous amount of stress in your life. It's unnecessary stress. Because here's what David says. Psalm 23, verse six. Surely goodness and love, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That's what I've got to look forward to. Goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to heaven anyway. You know, when a shepherd has a flock of sheep, he usually has a couple sheep dogs. He's leading it from the front and the sheep dogs are at the back keeping everybody kind of in line. And these twin sheep dogs of mercy and love or goodness and love are like little sheep dogs in your life, following along through your life. Is that what you expect? Are you, are, when, you can either look at your future one of two ways. You could say, man, what if everything goes wrong? What if I don't have enough money? What if I lose my job? What if somebody walks out on me? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? You can do that or you can look at the future and say, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those are your options. You can either see it from God's viewpoint or you can see it from your fearful anxiety. How do you lower the stress? You say I'm gonna expect God to finish what he starts. And even if everything went wrong in my life, I'm still going to heaven. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, what do you expect? What you expect, there's a word for that. It's called a goal. And that's why, remember, I'm trying to get you each week to set one goal during 50 days of transformation. If you don't set goals, you're not living by faith because goals are statements of faith. If you have your notebook with you, I want you to turn four pages in. Just count them, one, two, three, four. It's in the very beginning in the preface. So page, uh, actually, it's on page six, IV, Roman numeral six, my three month goals. And there's a place there for you to write down one goal in seven different areas of your life. Now we've already covered spiritual health, so I hope you've set a goal for your spiritual health. If you haven't, you're not expecting anything to happen in your life, in your spiritual health. You need to set a goal, that's an expectation, statement of faith. How about a physical goal? If you're in the Daniel plan, you might have a Daniel plan goal right there. If you're not in the Daniel plan, you could certainly say, my goal is to observe a true Sabbath for the next three months and see what'll happen if you actually took a full day off and didn't work, but you used it for worship, rest, and recreation. How much smarter would you be? How much more creative would you be? How much more energy would you have? Set a goal for your physical health and your spiritual health. Next week, we're gonna look at uh, emotional and mental and uh, spiritual, and all these other areas. The last verse on your outline, Jesus says this, come to me, come to me. Not come to church, not come to class, not come to clinic, come to me, Jesus says. All you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you more work to do. I think some people actually think that's what the verse says. <laughs> Come to me if you're weary and carrying heavy burdens and Jesus says I will give you what? Yes. Circle that, rest, rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For many years, I never understood that verse. First place, as a kid, I didn't know what a yoke was. I thought it was like the part around the egg, okay? Uh, in the middle of the egg. A yoke is a board 
that is stretched with two uh, you know, arches in it that you put over two cattle so that two cattle will pull a cart. The value of a yoke is it halves the load. Without a yoke, you got one cow that's got to pull that entire load by itself. But if you yoke up the cow with another cow, then the two cows together pull the load together and the load is half as heavy. Does that make sense? So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, I didn't know, I just thought it was like, sounded to me like, oh, he's gonna give me something else I gotta deal with? Take my yoke, I got a heavy enough burden myself. Lord, I don't need to take your problems on me. That's not what at all what he's saying. When he says, take my yoke upon you, he's not saying, I'm gonna give you my problems. Jesus doesn't have any problems. He's saying, take my yoke upon you, I'm gonna share your problem. I'm gonna share your load. I'm gonna take your stress, and I'm gonna pull it with you. Wow. Now he says three verbs in this verse. He says come, he says learn, and take. He says come to me, Jesus. And then he says, take the yoke on you. Team up with me. And then learn how I do it. This is gonna lighten your load. This is gonna reduce your stress. This is gonna make it easier for you to navigate. Now write this down. When I'm yoked with Christ, we move together, because you're obviously yoked together. We move together in the same direction and at the same speed. And those two are the problems that you have. You're going in the wrong direction and you're going at the wrong speed. But when you yoke up with Christ, you will go in the right direction and you will go at the speed that you can handle. And when you're yoked to Christ, you're not gonna go off in a ditch because he's gonna keep you on the right path. And when you're yoked to Christ, you're not gonna run too fast and burn yourself out because you're yoked to Christ. You need to come to him now. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I know there are many people who are tired and worn by the pace of modern living. And I know, Father, that of these different stresses that we've looked at, so many of them can be seen right here in our midst today. We know that many people are stressed out. Stressed out by worry, by fear, by conflict, by criticism, by indecision, by the rudeness of people around them, by a crowded schedule, by overwork, all of these different things. And Lord, if we just do it your way, life would be so much easier. If we would practice the Ten Commandments, if we would keep the Sabbath to rest our bodies, refocus our spirit, recharge our emotions. If we would fill our souls with beauty, not ugliness. If we would hear sounds of beauty and see scenes of beauty rather than filling our mind with so much negative news and negative talk shows and all of the conflict that is in the media today. Lord, I pray that each of these steps that David took, that we would take today. Now you pray, would you pray? Say, dear God, in your mind, just say, I wanna look to you to meet all my needs. I know that there's no person who could possibly meet all my emotional, spiritual, mental, physical needs. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And God, starting today, I'm going to obey your instructions about rest. You make me lie down in green pastures. Help me to fill my soul and my surroundings with beauty, with art, with music that you have given for the expression of emotions. Thank you that you make me lay down in green meadows and in, beside calm, quiet waters. And Father, those things that I don't know what to do and when I'm just confused and I lack the wisdom, 
Help me to go to you for guidance. Father, I need your wisdom in the days ahead. And when I go through dark valleys, help me not to be afraid of the shadow, but to turn to the light and look into your eyes, Jesus. And when I'm ready to give up, you know what I should do. And Father, when I feel like I'm under attack, and when I feel like others are against me, would you be my defender? Help me to speak no, no words of unkindness, but to return good for evil, to pray for those who persecute, to love those who hate, to do good to those who do evil. Would you be my defender, my protector, my fortress? Would you protect me like a shield? And let me trust you. And God, I'm, I'm gonna expect you to finish what you start in me. And rather than what ifing the future, I'm going to say surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus, you said to come to you, so I come to you, and I wanna take your yoke on me. I wanna team up with you. I want to learn of you, and I wanna move forward in the direction and at the pace that you choose. Slow me down, Lord, that I may see your plan for my life. Jesus Christ, I invite you to take over every area of my life and my mind and replace my stress with your serenity. In your name I pray, amen.